Um, okay. So we are, let's see, it's Wednesday, right? Um, we should be getting into genomics. We're a day behind. That's fine. We're just not going to do genome evolution. So chapter 24, that won't be on your next exam. So it'll only be um, uh, transcription, translation, biotechnology, um, genetic, genetic mutations. It is in the modules section. So um, yeah, and I'll get to that in just a second. So biotechnology and then genomics I'll do. Let's see, we'll finish biotechnology today. I'll do genomics on Friday and hopefully finish that up on Friday. Then we'll do a review for the final, for the exam five on Monday. We'll do that review. And then we'll also, I can answer any questions you have about the final for that Friday. I don't have time set aside for a final, final review. Um, your exam five will be, oh, we'll delete 24 there. So just chapters 15, 17, and 18. Um, that'll be May 5th, the last day of classes. And then two days later, you'll have your final exam. Uh, and if you go to modules, all the way down to the bottom, there's a couple really important study guides. Well, one really, really important one. If you haven't been using the study guides for the lecture exams, that's fine. Um, but the exam five study guide is here at the bottom. All of the slides are already here. So I already posted the genomics lecture that we're gonna cover. So all the information for your exam five is up here. Um, and then we'll do a review quiz on Monday like we normally do. Exam five study guide, the final exam study guide is also up here. If you wanna start looking at the final exam study guide. Um, the, so what I did for the final exam study guide is basically look at the previous study guides that I'd made for you and cut out a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so I wanted to, I want you guys to focus on studying what I think is the most important to kind of retain from this class and remember and take with you into the future. So rather than just studying everything from this class, definitely look at the final exam study guide. It'll guide you to the specific points that I'll be asking about. I'm not gonna ask about anything that's not on that study guide. So like I said, if you haven't been using the study guides, fine, you don't need to use exam five study guide, but I would definitely suggest at least looking at the final exam study guide so you kind of have something to focus on. Um, the final exam is going to be twice the length of a normal test, um, and it'll be evenly divided among all of the chapters. So I think it's like, so it'll be 80, 80 questions. Yeah, because you normally have 40. So 80 questions, all multiple choice. Um, and that, that'll, I think that comes out to about five questions per chapter that we went over, if that gives you any, if that helps at all. Any questions about that stuff? Okay. So that's done. I have a question. So the final will be in person in the bio labs, correct? Yes, yeah, good question, thank you. Yep, the final will be just like all your other exams. So we'll be in the bio labs in person at 110 on Friday, May 7th. All right. Oops. There we go. Okay, so now um, we're gonna finish up the biotech lecture. So we ended here looking at the knockout mice um, and the myostatin knocked out mice. We just got into talking about GMOs. Um, so I know a lot of people, well, a lot, some, some of you might have preconceptions about GMOs. Maybe you don't really know anything about them. So what I'm gonna do today is just kind of talk about some of the GMOs that basically affect you every day. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the social aspect too, which I think is pretty interesting um, considering there's a lot of information out there and a lot of opinions about GMOs. So a lot of the stuff we've gone over in here, there hasn't really been a whole lot of um, strong opinion in the public sphere <laughs> about, uh, but GMOs definitely elicit some strong opinions. 
So we'll talk about some of that today, finish up the biotechnology lecture. Um, and yeah. So we talked about these knockout mice. Um, plants are actually where I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about GMOs. A lot of crops that we eat um, and that are incorporated into a lot of our foods are actually GMO crops, so genetically modified. Um, plants are a little bit tougher to modify, actually. As surprising as that sounds, we think of plants as a little bit simpler. Plants are harder from a genetic perspective to actually modify. They have a lot of repeated DNA. Sometimes they have more than two copies of DNA. So it gets pretty complicated um, modifying plants. But we have done it. Not we. People have done it. Scientists have done it. Uh, but you can't do knockout plants. So it's not really possible to totally knock out a gene just because they have a really complicated genome. But you can still introduce DNA into plant genomes, which is a lot of what's been done just to make essentially tougher or more productive plants. So first off, um, a really important aspect of plant genetic engineering is the TI plasmid, which is, stands for tumor inducing, which sounds bad, but um, it just means it grows cells quickly, basically. So the cells will reproduce really quickly. This is uh, a plasmid, the DNA from a bacterium. So agrobacterium tumefaciens. They took uh, the, the part of, well, they, they take the gene of interest and put it into the bacterium. Sorry, like I was talking about before with the cloning, when they use the bacteria, put a gene into it, and then that bacteria just copies itself over and over. So you have more of that genetic material. So a gene of interest might be drought resistance, right? Drought is a huge issue in a lot of areas of the world, um, which makes it, which makes hunger more prevalent in those areas. So drought resistance is a really important, potentially a really important gene to introduce into a plant if you can. So they have done that with some plants through this TI plasmid. So they basically put the drought resistance gene, this is a simplification, obviously, <laughs> they put the drought resistance gene into this bacterium, it reproduces a lot of it, and then they essentially infect the plant with this bacterium. When the bacteria infects the plant, it incorporates its DNA into the plant's DNA, and then all of the DNA in the plant then has that drought resistance gene. So that's the basics of the TI plasmid. Um, on the next slide, You can kind of see a, a graphic of how this works, that infection process. So you have the agrobacterium, uh, sort of the tool for growing this gene. You put the gene of interest in, we'll imagine that's for drought resistance for some plant. Put it into the circular DNA of the bacterium. The bacterium reproduces over and over again. Um, and then you infect the plant nucleus, essentially one of the plant nuclei, with that bacterium, one or more. And then that, that cell divides with that new DNA in there, that drought resistance DNA, then it spreads over the entire plant. So then all of the cells of that plant have this drought resistance gene. Other aspects, again, dealing with agriculture, um, herbicide resistant plants or crops. So if you spray an herbicide on a crop field, depending on what the herbicide is and what the crop is, it could also kill the crop. So you don't want that to happen, but weeds are a major issue in crop fields. So if you imagine, here's a, a field of soybeans, it's all soybean. Um, weeds will easily come up in there, kind of shade them out, take nutrients from the soybeans, which you don't want. You don't want any competition for your crop in there. So they have created crop plants that are resistant to the herbicide and herbicides kill other plants. So herbicides kill plants, pesticides kill insects. We'll talk about insects in just a second. But herbicides, um, yeah, so the herbicide resistant plants, you can then spray herbicide all over the field of soybeans. You don't kill the soybeans, you only kill the plants you don't want. Um, so this has been created, and the most popular one is called Roundup Ready. Have you guys heard of Roundup before? If you ever are trying to get weeds, rid of weeds in your yard, or if your parents are, you often spray Roundup. 
you can buy Roundup at the store. It's just, uh, it's glyphosate is the chemical name. Um, and it just kills weeds or plant, I guess, yeah, certain types of plants, I should say. Plants that have uh, incorporated this herbicide resistance are called Roundup Ready. So if you ever hear or see signs, like a lot of times it'll be signs along um, agricultural fields that say Roundup Ready, that just means you can spray Roundup on them and it won't kill the crop. It'll only kill the weeds that you don't want there. This is really important. Um, in the sense of being able to grow crops and not have to deal with all of these competing plants. And if you're eating US, US grown soy, so soy is in pretty much everything you eat every day. If you're eating any of that soy from the US, which you probably are, it's probably GM. So it's probably genetically modified soy. Most of the soybeans that are grown in the US are genetically modified. They're this Roundup ready. So. Sometimes genetically modified only means that they have this herbicide resistance gene in them. Sometimes it means they have more to them, which I'll talk about, but um, yeah. Um, organic, I don't know if the, I'm not sure if USDA organic can include GM or not, because it's so organic deals with well, no, if, if there's a pesticide that's, or if there's an herbicide that's sprayed on the field, it's not organic. So yeah, I guess that would go hand in hand. So if it's organic, it's probably not Roundup ready. And then with insects, they're obviously also a huge problem when you're growing a bunch of the same crop. They will come in and decimate a crop in no time. So creating insect resistant crops has also been done. The most, uh, kind of the oldest way to do this or the most common way um, is using a toxin that's created by a bacterium and infecting the plants with that DNA again. So you, you have insecticidal proteins that are growing in this Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterium. That's why it's BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. That bacterium creates a toxin. If an insect eats that bacterium, the insect dies. So if you can incorporate that into the DNA, that gene that creates that Bt toxin into a gene within the plant, then any insect, say a caterpillar, which is a huge uh, crop pest, um, anything that eats that leaf will then ingest that toxin that's now being produced by the plant and will die. This creates a much um, a highly uh, <laughs> less need for um, pesticides, right? So if you have BT crops that are producing this toxin, it's kind of a natural insecticide. You don't have to spray a bunch of chemicals all over the field to kill the bugs that are potentially eating the plant. So from an environmental and human health standpoint, this is uh, potentially really beneficial. So no need for usually insecticide chemicals if you have BT crops. So all of this, all this GM stuff basically is taking some kind of useful gene, putting it in something that we need to grow well and in large volumes. That's what a lot of this agricultural GM stuff is. So there's BT corn. Corn will produce this um, Bacillus thuringiensis toxin, and it's the second most common GM crop grown globally. So there is a ton of GM corn that you're eating that contains this, um, this toxin that's toxic to in insects. It's not toxic to us, obviously, if it were, that'd be bad. Just insects. And you can also stack these technologies. So you can have BT resistance as well as Roundup Ready incorporated into the same plant. So if you have, and that's called stacking these technologies, so stacked crops. So you can have um, corn that you can spray herbicide on and it won't die and also doesn't get eaten by insects. So that kind of makes it, it's a double whammy.
And another really important crop we don't really think about, but rice uh, sustains a lot of people around the world. In poorer areas, um, they don't have enough access to beta carotene, which eventually creates vitamin A, which is important in a lot of our functionality. It's deficient in a lot of ch children in developing countries. So they've actually engineered rice that will produce beta carotene. So a whole new biochemical pathway that wasn't originally ever in rice. Rice never made beta carotene, but they introduced um, a gene that now allows rice to make beta carotene, which means millions of children around the world now have enough beta carotene, which means they have enough vitamin A, which is amazing. A really important note here that I haven't talked about too much um, is that this technology, so this GM technology, is freely available. So it's not owned by a particular company. Roundup Ready Crops and other GM um, technologies have a lot of commercial entanglements. So Monsanto, if you've heard of Monsanto, it's a huge agricultural technology company. They own Roundup Ready Crops. Um, so if you, want a Roundup, if you want Roundup Ready seeds for your farm, you have to go to them to buy them. So they have a monopoly essentially on this Roundup Ready technology. They spend a lot of money developing it. It makes sense. Um, golden rice is not like that. It's like I said, freely available. Um, thankfully, they're not making developing countries pay for uh, something that's desperately needed for children who are deficient in vitamin A. If you haven't seen it already, the Food Inc. documentary is really interesting. It talks a lot about this and some of the, the commercial aspects of these uh, biotechnologies, especially specifically with Monsanto, um, which is a huge company, multi-billion dollar company that owns these. And there's pluses and minuses, obviously. Uh, a lot of farmers use Roundup Ready crops, but they can't harvest their own seeds. So if you grow corn, normally you can harvest your seed, replant it, and it's kind of a self-fulfilling, you know, um, you can get it redone every year. You can regrow it every year. With Roundup Ready, you have to buy new seed every single year from who? Monsanto. Uh, so there's some interesting and complicated commercial aspects that go along with a lot of this GM stuff. So anyway, if you want to, Food Inc., it's a really interesting documentary that'll tell you a little bit more about that. So social issues, I just wanna really briefly talk about this because, well, not really briefly, how many people generally think of GM as negative? Like before I went into this, GMOs. Yeah, they get a pretty bad rap, right? And I'm not saying they're all good. I, I see both sides of it, um, but I think generally GMOs, I mean, there's, there's food that's labeled no GMOs in this, right? So you automatically think, oh my God, GMOs must be terrible. Um, and I think a lot of that is due to a lack of knowledge. So the, the plants that I just talked about, those are genetically modified crops. There are reasons to be worried about genetically modifying things, I think, um, but most people are worried about it from a health standpoint. Um, and there's been no evidence that, and there have been tons of studies that any of those GM crops, BT corn, uh, Roundup Ready crops, any of those golden rice, none of them negatively harm human health. So from a human health perspective, um, there's very little chance that these cause any kind of negative effect on human health. There are some cons. It mostly comes up when we talk about environmental aspects, which is where I guess that's what worries me the most about GM crops. Um, there's some huge benefits, obviously. We're decreasing hunger around the world. So increased productivity means less hunger. That's awesome fewer chemicals in the environment. If you don't have to spray pesticides everywhere and the plants can, are just nat naturally pesticide resistant, that's amazing. And they can be cheaper to produce. Um, the cons I have listed, like I said, mostly deal with environmental aspects. So primarily loss of biodiversity. So if we imagine insect resistant crops that interbreed with some kind of natural population, then that plant might be insect resistant, which can throw off the whole balance. We haven't talked a lot about those kind of big concepts in here, but you can lose biodiversity. Those genes can move into wild relatives, which we don't really want, um, but we can't always prevent that because we have fields of these GM crops. 
So then weeds, insects in natural communities, not in crop fields, can become resistant to um, insecticides, pesticides, that kind of stuff. So environmentally, I think there's still a big question mark. Um, from a human health standpoint, the data show that there's no danger to eating any GM crops, but hopefully this gives you guys a little bit more information. The goal of this, a lot of this lecture is really just to get you guys to understand a little bit more about what you hear in the news. So you hear a lot about this in the news. Hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more about what you're, what you're hearing. Okay. But now, yeah, now you can make up your own mind as to how you feel about them. All right, so that's all the GM stuff. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple other important biotechnologies that we don't really think of as biotechnologies, but are really important. The first being biofuels. Have you guys heard of biofuels? Okay, so ethanol is a really important biofuel that they put in all of our gas now. It's made from corn. So being able to use Basically, recently fixed carbon versus fossilized carbon is the difference between biofuel, biofuels and fossil fuels. You're still using plants and their carbon as the resource to power engines, let's say. Um, but biofuels are using essentially recently dead plants. So um, algae and corn are the two that are most commonly used. Rather than harvesting carbon that has been you know, in the ground from fossilized organisms for millions of years. So it's renewable, potentially more environmentally friendly. Um, you still have, you know, some carbon output, carbon dioxide output, because carbon is the, the source of the energy. And you also need space to grow them. So there's, like with everything, any, any move in one direction, there's pluses, there's minuses to all of these biotechnologies. Uh, but it is renewable, uh, and it creates less overall um, potentially harmful greenhouse gases. So microalgae, I think everyone kind of knows that corn is used for ethanol and put in our gas. Microalgae is actually a huge source of biofuels these days, which we don't think about. Little tiny algae being grown in these huge, what we call photobioreactors. What they're looking for are algae that produce a lot of oil, so lipids. So the algae that are really highly Efficient at producing lipids are what they will grow in these photobioreactors and basically harvest that oil. So same idea, it's a carbon-based oil, just like in fossil fuels, we harvest the carbon-based oil from fossil fuels. Um, it's just recently fixed. All right, so that's biofuels. Something else we don't think about much, which is probably a good thing, is wastewater treatment. Wastewater treatment uses uh, biotechnology in the form of microorganisms. So after you eat and get rid of everything that you've eaten, it goes to a wastewater treatment plant. Microorganisms like bacteria are essentially eating all of our solid waste, or at least 95% of our solid waste. So they break it down, leaving behind essentially cleaner water. So still um, chemical treatments typically happen to the water, but these bacteria and other microorganisms basically take all the solids out. Not something we love to think about, but very important. Um, and then they essentially clump up into what we call sludge. So like wastewater treatment sludge. Um, and then that can be kind of reused. The microorganisms can be put in another vat, eat up all the solid waste, <laughs> and then kind of move on to the next. And you have much cleaner water, at least from a solids perspective. Like I said, chemicals are still added and, um, to help get rid of anything that the microorganisms can't take care of. But without this kind of biotechnology, uh, I don't know. I don't want to imagine what our wastewater treatment would be like. Okay. And then medical applications. So we've already talked a little bit about medical applications in the form of that CRISPR-Cas9 system where we can edit genes and live cells, which is amazing. This is a little bit older than that, but still really important because there are a lot of diabetic people in the world and more and more as we get less and less healthy. So insulin, you may or may not know, well, hopefully you know it's used by diabetics, right? So diabetics can't 
they don't produce, produce enough insulin um, or maybe they don't produce really any insulin depending on what kind of diabetes they have. So they need to inject insulin into themselves. Insulin is what controls blood sugar levels. Why does that matter? It basically too much blood sugar um, or too little blood sugar can affect the functioning of our organs. So too much, too little, not a good thing. Insulin helps control that. Without insulin, blood sugar just kind of goes up and down really quickly, depending on if you've just eaten or haven't eaten in a while. Anyone who doesn't have diabetes has enough insulin to kind of even out that up and down, you know, spike and crash in blood sugar. Diabetics have to inject it. So we don't really think about insulin as where do you get insulin from? It's just kind of freely, not freely available, but it's available. It's a well-known medical treatment. Before, I don't know when this actually happened. I don't even want to give you a year, but previously before the biotechnology where we can kind of grow our own insulin, we used to harvest it from pigs. So pig insulin was harvested from animals that were slaughtered. It was not nearly as effective as human insulin. So pigs have insulin, it's just a little bit different. So it wasn't as good at actually controlling blood sugar levels as human insulin. So it was a great kind of, um, at the time, a good biotechnology to harvest it from pigs, but now we can genetically engineer human insulin. So back to E. coli, our wonderful E. coli bacteria that's used for a bunch of different stuff. Um, we can now insert the human insulin gene into an E. coli bacterium into the plasmid. It will basically grow that insulin. There will, it'll replicate its DNA. So you get more and more insulin and you can just um, take it out of the culture of E. coli. Yes. That might be possible. So yeah, um, Shay was asking for you guys on Zoom about using CRISPR to, um, to fix the gene that isn't producing enough insulin, which is, yeah, I don't know if they're looking into that, but that seems like a really uh, appropriate use of the CRISPR technology. So they haven't done that yet that I know of, but they might be on their way to doing it. So now having human insulin, it's a lot more effective, um, and a lot more efficient at controlling blood sugar levels in humans versus using pig insulin. <laughs> so here we have human cell, we have the insulin gene that was um, identified, put the insulin gene into the bacterial plasmid. So then when the bacteria reproduces, it's reproducing that ability to grow or to produce insulin. You can grow that in a culture and then basically just extract the insulin and you have pretty pure human insulin. Oh, a culture is just where um, like a, a sterile environment where you're growing some kind of microorganism. So like, yeah, a Petri dish or a test tube or something like that in the lab. Yeah. Okay. And that... We'll get done early. Awesome. That wraps up all the biotechnology stuff. Um, we'll just get into genomics on Friday. I don't think we need to jump into that now. I'll just let you guys go early. We'll finish up genomics, start it and finish it on Friday, and then do a review on Monday.